It's clear that struggle doesn't take off for the holidays. The gremlins don't go on vacation. Checks bounce, chemotherapy appointments are scheduled, interventions are planned, relationships keep unraveling, being alone feels even lonelier, parents negotiate who will have the kids on Christmas morning, and the never enough is in full swing. As I prepare to spend the next few days with my family and friends, I come back to this. I will find my holiday magic in the mess. I will practice love and gratitude with a special group of folks who keep showing up and loving me, not despite my vulnerabilities, but because of them. Brene Brown. I'm Lauren Hubele, health educator and gemotherapy expert. And I'm here again with my low, loyal co-host, Japanese acupuncturist, Megan Limp. Megan, welcome. Hi, Lauren, it's great to be with you again. And we are so pleased to have with us again, Cameron Scott, passionate polyvagalist and therapist. Hi, Cameron. Delighted to be here with you wonderful women. Okay, ladies, we're gonna unpack the holidays and give everyone a survival guide because the gremlins don't go on vacation. I love this line because not only is it true, but sometimes the gremlins become more active and negotiating 2020 holiday season is going to take some work. So we could armor up or we could try something new this year. And that's exactly what I'm looking forward to discussing with you two brilliant women. So in light of all we've learned together these five months, Megan, in polyvagal theory, are you approaching the holidays any differently? Well, certainly on the surface, the holidays look quite different this year. We're navigating whether we're going to have brunch with my parents like we always do. And whether we all feel safe being in the house without masks because we would have to do that to eat and whether we're going to see my husband's family, um, which we haven't decided. And uh, we genuinely in, in, as Brene Brown said, sort of all of the mess can typically show up pretty vulnerable with each other. And, um, and I, I love, uh, just watching the holidays play out. And, you know, we have children, so there's, there's not that level for them. There's just a lot of joy and play and zest in the holidays with children. And so for me, that is one of my ventral anchors through the holiday is experiencing it with them. And often when I am at a party for the holidays that can feel a little messy, one of my strategies is to just play with the kids. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, because they know how to be there and be yeah. present. Beautiful. Well, I, I know our holidays are already off to a different start because my middle daughter sent out the instruction booklet for how we will navigate Thanksgiving at her home. And on, on one part, I was like, oh, this is where we are. And the other part, so grateful because now we all know the rules. But I'm sure we'll have our own uh, bumps to work through when we all arrive and someone doesn't follow the rules. <laughs> Cameron, what about you? It's it's such a wonderful new and different and, and uncharted waters that in any way who's interested in their autonomic nervous systems, um, you know, it is a great time to to listen in to where these holidays are, are taking us. And um, I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown's and I, you know, I, the fact that she talks about, you know, it's often the holidays bring more gremlins to dinner, <laughs> either, you know, theoretically in, in our systems and in, in our expectations and in our, you know, what we're feeling in the moments or, you know, whether we're, you know, actually with people, it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> Oh, yeah, so true. So, so ladies, we may have some new listeners this time around, and we are on the 22nd podcast, Exploring Polyvagal Theory Together. Um, bravo. And um, 
I think we might do a little review because when I think about navigating the holidays, I think the first thing we have to be able to navigate is our own autonomic nervous system and those states. And Cameron, I don't know anyone that does it better than you do. Will you break this down for us? It's the wonderful aspect of our autonomic nervous systems, which are functioning all the time to either invite us into a sense of ease and safety or whether it's picking up cues of danger or threat. And since it's working as a surveillance system precognitively all the time, the wonders of beginning to know our autonomic nervous system and befriending it is we might as well have an ally, not a, a, an enemy or a, an adversary because mm -hmm. these autonomic nervous systems are listening below our awareness all the time. Yeah. Beautiful. So we have three states, right, for our autonomic mm -hmm. nervous system, and we're moving through these states. Can you share those with our listeners? Yes, it's, and it's a wonderful hierarchy, thanks to the work of Stephen Porges and, and Deb's relentless application to this work, because it, it also, you know, goes along with our evolution. Our simplest and most primitive autonomic nervous system is simply one of rest, digest, disconnect, when our system is very, very stressed. And I think we all know those moments where we just collapse, you know, can't connect. Life just feels like mm, no go. And it's, it's a biologic state, but that's, that's the state of dorsal vagal or dorsal vagal collapse, dorsal vagal shutdown. And corresponds with the evolution uh, of, you know, thinking of reptile when it's just all too much, pulls itself into its shell and there's not a whole lot to be done. And then as we evolved and we came into our ability and our brain function came into the ability to fight or flight, we get this mobilized response in the, the hierarchy. So we're coming up Deb's ladder and that's that ability to fight or flight. It's still an adaptive survival response. I think cavemen and I think they could fight like crazy or they could run. There wasn't a lot of discussion about it. There was no choice in the matter, but it did get them through their days. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as we evolved all the way up to the second part of the vagal nerve, we have our ventral vagal, which is when we came into evolutionary, that wonderful prefrontal cortex, which allowed us to have social engagement and meaning making of our experiences to talk about, to wonder, curiosity, compassion, all these wonderful aspects. And that in, is the hierarchy and in our autonomic nervous system, really where our autonomic nervous systems would like to be run and be like to come from. However, when our autonomic nervous systems are listening into a moment and they perceive, it perceives any cues of danger or threat, often our not autonomic nervous system, which is our biology, not a, 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 a thought, takes us into some sort of survival, autonomic survival response. Great, great. Megan, do you have some thoughts to add to that? No, I think that's beautifully illustrated. Um, yeah, Cameron, well said, thank you. Yeah. Megan, I, I do have a favorite describer that you use for a dorsal and that's the state of conservation. And that makes so much sense to me that um, we drop into, not by choice, our biology um, moves us in there so that we can conserve and we're, it, it, we're restoring, right? We're restoring, yeah. So, you know, as an acupuncturist coming from the background of thinking about our vital energy in our body um, through the eyes of the concept of chi, um, which is the animating force within all of us, within all living things. And um, it really makes sense to me to think about the three states um, in the way that I understand and experience chi in myself and others, which is when the chi feels weak, we tend to, as Cameron says about dorsal, we tend to have a flatter voice that might be a little softer. There tends to be less movement and animation 
Um, and that is mental too. Maybe we feel disconnected from ourselves or foggy or um, a lack of ability to concentrate, just a lack of mental and physical um, movement and animation in general. And so, of course, if our nervous system is out to protect us, uh, thank goodness, then it does what needs to be done, which is it conserves that little bit of chi that we have uh, to keep us alive. And then, you know, the opposite extreme might be when we really have an abundance of this chi, but it sort of feels very chaotic and it's moving around a lot, but it doesn't feel in flow or in connection with ourselves and other people. And the voice tends to get loud and we might sort of act impulsively without really thinking about what we're doing and, um, and over mobilize. Um, which is another way, you know, that Cameron was describing that as fight or flight. We tend to really move without feeling very organized about the way that we're moving. And then the third state, which is ventral vagal from the point of view of our chi would be when we're in what we feel like is balance. You know, Deb was talking um, recently, I heard her say something about how we need to identify what feels safest to us today which might be different than what was safe to us yesterday or next week, because how resilient and um, organized and in flow we feel in this moment today determines how um, sensitive or prone to dysregulation our nervous system is going to be today. You know, ladies, we're, we're putting this podcast out right be before one of the largest American holidays. I think the largest American holidays, right? Thanksgiving. And I, I like to visualize the Thanksgiving table with all the characters and all the gremlins that will show up. And <laughs> think of these folks as individual autonomic nervous systems, but placing myself there and thinking about what kinds of things make me move up and down <laughs> on my ladder and, and what, what might work. Um, when we talk about, when you talked about that sympathetic state, I can think about multiple things my mother-in-law might say that might mobilize that <laughs> sympathetic state in me like, questioning what I'm eating and that am I only eating vegetables or is there you know a, enough on my plate or um, something along that line and I think eating meals with people for anyone particularly with any triggering um, around food and um, uh, the way we nurture ourselves that can bring up a lot of sympathetic energy and the desire to protect ourselves yeah absolutely yeah and and then i think when we aren't able to feel safe still we begin to disappear and i think that unfortunately happens to far too many people when they're with their family because that is the only safe place is dropping mm -hmm. into dorsal going through the motions, my body's here, but I'm not. Um, mm -hmm. And we may be living through old patterns um, and um, not realizing that um, we have the capability to establish safety for ourselves in these situations. Is that ever something either of you have experienced in, over the holidays? I, Lauren, I think that that's such an important point that you bring up because absolutely that is something I have experienced. But in addition to that, what you're implying and what you're saying is that, you know, what we might be judging ourselves or feeling guilty and ashamed for doing um, any number of behaviors of how we're coping with the family situation, maybe feeling that we're retreating and we're thinking about when we can get out of there and we want to disappear or we feel defeated by something somebody said and we just want to, um, again, maybe pull into our shell and block it out or the reverse and we feel really mobilized and we want to um, engage in some kind of you know debate with somebody or however we respond, um, we can 
of course, choose to judge ourselves or have uh, negative feelings towards ourselves for it. But we can also, as Cameron was saying, become our own ally. And as we become more informed about how we view ourselves and the world in each state, we can see that our nervous system is simply protecting us mm -hmm. when it's um, receiving cues that don't feel safe. Yeah. yeah. And, and knowing what those cues are, I think, is very important. Actually, awareness about all of this is so important. And, and that's why I felt it was important to start with the stages or the states, excuse me, and knowing even before we walk into a room where we are yes. will help us um, manage um, and befriend what happens next. Cameron, I see you nodding. You. I, I know, I love that. Something, it, whether it's in my teaching work and my clinical work or, it, or just my own little life, a, a practice I've adopted recently is taking that moment to honor these transitions. You know, before you walk into a home or a moment or a conversation, taking that moment is almost as if you're gonna take your own internal, you know, hi, how am I? Where, where am I? Am I feeling well? well oriented, calm, at ease, curious, or am I a little bit anxious, a little bit tweaked, or have I just had it and can't imagine, you know, having to go through the next few moments, but taking that moment and then, you know, noticing, noticing naming where we are in our own systems, our own autonomic nervous systems can automatically bring a little bit of curiosity in a moment to maybe take a deep breath or stand up more straight or just say, yeah, that is where I am. And then enter a next moment. It's a way of like, and I think of Megan being an acupuncturist, you know, taking, taking our own pulse beat and where, where am I right now? Mm -hmm. And it's so helpful. I've had any number of people say, literally taking 60 seconds and just checking in can be a wonderful way of befriending and, and bringing our autonomic nervous system into our, our lives as an ally. Mm. Yeah, and why don't we do that before we get there, before we <laughs> enter the room and somebody asks us how we're doing and we say, great. And in that moment, your nervous system is gonna tell you the truth anyway, whether you verbalize <laughs> it or not. <laughs> no. So let's check in before we go, right? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, you know, as you both are, are speaking, I'm thinking of all the states we go through. I mean. I'll just give an example, you know, for, for us to spend Thanksgiving dinner with our daughter, we have a 45 minute drive up I-35, the worst highway in all of America, I'm sure. And that alone is going to throw me into sympathetic, not because I'm nervous, but because my husband is in a sympathetic state in his um, defensive driving that he partakes in. So there's that, and, and I'm already activated. And then we show up and, and then I need to bring myself back down. Like what, what kind of tools might I use? Maybe I need to walk around the block first. What a great idea. Before I walk in, in a mobilized sympathetic state and start moving things on my daughter's counter that she would prefer, I leave alone, right? But I'm, I don't even realize I'm doing it because I'm in that mobilized state. So that's a, a note to self right there. You know, park the car, take a walk around, check in, and then you can come in in a connected place and, um, not put all of your sympathetic energy over everyone that might be in a whole different. Have, have enough curiosity about your own system. If you're starting to get mobilized, what is it picking up on around you? I'm a big fan of the bathroom. Nobody really ever gives you a hard time for taking a moment or two to excuse yourself to the bathroom. <laughs> and there's a moment it's like, okay, where am I now on my ladder? <laughs> So-and-so just said such and such, and oh, I'm pretty mobilized. Or, you know, I've been cooking all day. I've been mobilized by this person, this person, this person. And I'm like, and now I pretty much had it. And I can feel my mobilization draining down into, yeah, I'll just go pour myself a big drink and, you know, glaze over. <laughs> You know, I think that's, I think this brings up 
a really beautiful um, exercise that we can do, which is identifying, um, you know, I, I think it's, it, we can give ourselves permission to have a little bit more space to take care of ourselves inside of these family holiday um, parties um, or get togethers. And so, but we can only offer ourselves, you know, this space and these tools if we know what it is that would feel more safe to us. So as I was thinking about this earlier, I was kind of doing an experiment. So how can I um, offer myself some tools? So Lauren, this is a great example. You're saying maybe you'll walk around the block. Well, of course you might never even have given yourself permission to do that, but there's nothing wrong with walking around the block. If somebody was at a party at our home and they wanted to get some fresh air, people say that all the time, I'm gonna step out and get some fresh air. No one, you know, there's nothing. Sure. Um, negative about that. And Cameron with the bathroom. And then Lauren, this other beautiful strategy that you brought up last week, which cannot be overlooked, which is if you can't engage anymore with people at that moment, help clean up, help in the kitchen. Or, you know, I, I sometimes like to retreat and play with the kids. Yeah. And another interesting strategy is think about what does feel safe at the party to you. So Mm -hmm. Who's going to be there that you know that you could have a discussion with that might actually be pretty benign? So um, yeah. there's always going to be somebody who feels safer to talk to there. There's always going to be a place to sit that feels better than the others or an amount of time that you can stay that feels yeah. safer than others. Maybe even some discussion points like, you know, we all love our children. So I often find that if I know that I'm in a discussion with somebody who I don't have a lot in common with, and there might be some areas that I don't want to get into. I might ask them about, you know, their grandkids or something along those lines, because it's a very easy way to connect. Yeah. And we find those ways, it's wonderful, Megan, because there are ways we can self-regulate, invite at that a little bit more by, you know, doing something like the walk or the cleaning up or the bathroom break. And then co-regulation doesn't mean talking about what state we're in necessarily at all. It means moving towards something that would invite a sense of connection that is feels safer or more comfortable or more at ease. And inviting other people into to comment about that. You know, I, I think too, how often I would have used this in former times um, is just placing my hands on my heart. Like you've so often recommended, Megan, what a difference. So you just wear a nice big scarf so no one knows what <laughs> you're, you're doing, but placing your hands on your heart, oh, that could change everything right there. It's beautiful. Another beautiful, you know, some people, um, the heart to me feels like such a cue of safety, mm -hmm. but if that doesn't work for you, um, there are, you know, placing your hand on your cheek or your forehead mm -hmm. or the back of your head um, or down below your navel and your abdomen. There's quite a few choices and, and your body will tell you which one feels the most grounding. Yeah. There's that wonderful expression, stop and smell the roses as an invitation to bring yourself more into ventral or more into presence. But if you don't happen to have roses to stop by, you know, we can use, use some you know, lotion to, to touch, or if you have a good smell, a, a candle or an essential oil, because that also encourages that gently interrupting and, and doing something that's really inviting of a sense of safety and well being. All of these things, you know, through the sensations. You know, one more strategy that I find really helpful for me, and I, um, I think this started organically in my practice um, because people often share very intimately with, with me, of course, um, before we start treatment. Um, but then we also have to shift into fitting a treatment into that time too, right? So we need to, uh, I need to find a way for um, people to feel heard and for me to get enough information and also um, keep it sort of organized mm -hmm. and flowing. And uh, so I often say things that the other person knows I'm listening without engaging in too much back and forth, which is, I hear you. And who doesn't love to be heard? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't imply that you agree or disagree. It's a safe place for all of us to be heard. You know, I have to give a little plug for um, um, On Being's um, podcast, Poetry Unbound. Have either of you just heard the 
there was a recent one about um, inviting my gay boyfriend to dinner. And it was the family Thanksgiving dinner and the poet was writing a, a note to his parents in the poem of how you will behave and how you will engage. And it was so beautiful, but it actually um, gave lines to them, you will say, and even though you have feel you have nothing in common, um, perhaps you could talk about the recipes that were made. And it made me think, I mean, that is such a beautiful common ground with aunt so-and-so who you know your political beliefs are completely different from, and you probably have layers of differences, but you ask her for her stuffing recipe and there you are, you're both co-regulating, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, another thought came up and, and I can point folks to our breathing room um, exercises because we have seven very short podcasts that I think you could do these quite subtly. Cameron, you did a breathing exercise that I think you someone could engage in without the whole table knowing what they're involved with. Is that correct? Yeah, I think there, and I can't even remember exactly what you're referring to, but breath is one of those things. If we're noticed in any way, our, our breath is challenged, you know, feel into it. Often an exhale, if it feels, inhale, if it feels possible, a slow, deep inhale can be very regulated. And also a, a longer exhale can also bring. So it's yeah. balances. I love the example that without knowing polyvagal theory in um, preschools when a, a little one got all, you know, mobilized and all anxious or all upset or all, all whatever. <laughs> and they'd invite them over the corner of the room and say, wow, you, you know, what's going on right now? You want to blow out the imaginary candle on the birthday cake and cupcake and make a wish. And in the moment where a child could be completely overwhelmed, who doesn't resonate with taking a deep breath and blowing out the candle, long sustained exhale and making a wish. Mm, beautiful. Can we not all be kids sometimes too and, and have the simplest of practices bring us in back into that smile, back into that, yeah, I feel better. Yes, mm. and sighing. Yes. Deb talks about sighing, the practice of sighing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be careful because if we're with other people, they can misinterpret that sighing. Yeah. Yeah. But we do it spontaneously sometimes. And if you go into the restroom or you step outside, you can certainly sigh because it's, you know, it has been shown that it is a reset for our Absolutely. physiology and that it also interrupts our um, train of thought. Um, in our mind so that it can offer a reset and sort of interrupt whatever rabbit hole we've gone down mentally and uh, how we're feeling physically as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hey, ladies, you've shared so generously. I, I think we've given our listeners a good menu of items to think over and consider in navigating these weeks ahead and holiday parties. And I think it's so important to go back just to one of the lines of Brene Brown's because we need to practice love and gratitude for those special folks who do keep showing up year after year. And we may not be aligned in so many ways, but we can find common ground and we need to do it by co-regulating and checking in and befriending our own nervous system so that we can be present to them as well. Um, any closing thoughts, Cameron? Mm. And it's not a destination, it's a journey. And as we move through these holidays, as we move through the intention to befriend and, and bring more, you know, compassionate energy to ourselves and others, we're gonna have messy moments. So we, we notice them and we go, oh, well. <laughs> and, and then we continue on our, our journey. Yeah. Cause that's part we're, of it. We're gonna <laughs> fall, we're gonna have moments. We, if you're not having moments, I will worry about you, but more and more how we can have moments, messy moments and, and come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Great. You know, when we leave the party and we realize after we left that we um, felt very activated or like we wanted to crawl inside of our shell and we weren't aware of it at the moment, that's okay too. Because I think as Lauren said, you know, honoring those that continue to show up again and again in our life, I think that we can honor our nervous system for protecting us and caring for us and helping us to connect, knowing that we also are continuing to show up even when it's not pretty. Yeah. Well and said. an Epsom salt bath when you get home with a little essential oil will take care of the rest. <laughs> Beautiful. So we'll be taking a short break, break and recording these podcasts for a few weeks. But in preparation, we've made some mini episodes answering questions from our listeners. Um, so please stay tuned for those coming out each week. And we'll be back to kick off 2021 with further polyvagal explorations. Um.